Welcome, everybody. Uh, a hotly anticipated PPLI deep dive where we talk about immediate income from PPLI. And we, we tucked in PPVA, too, although, again, I think, as you guys will see, the real driver of this conversation is going to be looking at utilizing PPLI uh, for, for immediate income, uh, which is an interesting, I, I think, concept. Uh, when we when you think about PPLI, most of our clients, and historically, if you probably look at you know the, the universe of PPLI, most of it has been uh, you know, dynasty, you know, family trust planning, all that stuff. It's the, I'm going to never going to touch the, in, the, the corpus, the income. I'm never going to touch that money, put it in a PPLI policy and just let it compound and, and accrue to the family's benefit. Uh, this concept actually came about through some work that we did with an RIA out in California. And that's what this case study was developed from. We'll get into that here more in a minute, but it was, it's actually created a ton of, um, case opportunities and, and fact patterns with uh, numerous uh, other advisors we work with simply because it's kind of a little bit of a paradigm shift, right? Again, instead of thinking about this is money that's going to be in a trust and be set aside uh, for, you know, my kids or my grandkids or whatever, this is, let's put money into this PPLI policy and then let's start pulling money out immediately and let's spend it. Uh, let's, let's, let's have this benefit accrue to the actual owner of this policy, so you know it be it will be your clients who want to buy this to improve their um, their lifestyle, their spendable income, things like that. So, any any other quick comments, Frank? Before we just yeah, get no, on? I, right. I mean, I I think it's fair to say as you as you said that most of our clients, right? I mean, are thinking in a multi generational way. Uh, but I think when you have conversations with advisors, the what we're about to go over really is an eye opener. Um, and it really, you know, I think that it both disturbs preconceived notions as well as this is a big difference between traditional insurance, right? Traditional yeah. insurance with surrender charges, different loan agreements, uh, loan terms. It's certainly in the first 10 years of a contract. And so, uh, you know, I, I think this is going to be a, an interesting one. Yeah. I, like I said, I think I think I've I've modeled this no less than twenty times since the beginning of the year. Like this concept, now yep. they, they haven't all proceeded, but they're they're creating ideas, fact patterns, uh, and, and whatnot from other advisors. I think we're going to see a lot of this uh, going forward. So, um, well, let's see. That should have moved the slides, but now we're going to. There we go. All right. So, uh, for those who are watching, and then if you're watching this online later, we've got three previous deep dives that we've already done this year. Uh, repurposing existing life insurance for PPLI. That was a really cool case study around using existing uh, policies that are already uh, you know bought, paid for, all that fun stuff, using that for PPLI. Charitable planning uh, objectives with PPVA. That was back in, I think that was maybe March, Frank, that we did that one. Yep. Uh, and then, then just last month, we covered all the investment options for PPLI, PPVA. We did a deep dive on the SMA and IDF approaches to uh, the investments in here. So today, again, income. And we think you guys are going to like that. If you want to go back and watch any of those. Also, just so you guys know, we're bookmarking all these. So there's different kind of chapters if you want to think of it that way. So if you just want to jump straight to the case study or straight to a different section in the video, um, those are there. That way you don't have to sit there for the whole hour and, and you know, slog your way through the entire, uh, you know, deep dive again. So uh, you want to take this one, Frank? Yeah. So here, here's our agenda for today. We're going to go through uh, three different case studies with respect to PPLI versus taxable accounts. We're going to be showing a, a maximum income design, a let's compare taking the same out of a taxable account and the PPLI, and then what the residual value is to the family via the PPLI, and then just an accumulation only model. Uh, we're, we're going to go into how do policy loans work? What are those terms? And then PPVA case studies, right? One immediate income, income starting in 15, and then an accumulation only. Again, Ben and I want you, got everybody who's here to interrupt at any point, answer questions. I'll be monitoring, monitoring the chat. Uh, so I've, let's try to make this as interactive as we possibly can. And you know, the questions make, I, if you're thinking of a question, I'm sure other people on the webinar are also thinking of the same question. So that's right. That's don't right. be shy. Yeah. Um, we will spend a lot of time on here. We, we've added this slide actually to kind of our standard client deck just to kind of talk at first, is why, why in the world are people using PPLI? And really what I want to highlight here at the top is, again, it, it's largely driven by income taxes 
and again, largely what we've seen historically has been this, you know, wealth transfer, charitable impact, you know, util utilization of PPLI. Today, again, we're just going to be talking about this. Wait a second. Is there a way to actually use PPLI to uh, have our clients enjoy more liquidity, more after-tax liquidity in their, in their lifestyle needs? Um, and so, again, being able to do that with this bullet point right here of not disrupting their current investment relationship is really critical. So we, we will, again, spend more time on that. So onward to the case study. Um, so like, like I said at the start, this came from an RIA in Orange County. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly the fact pattern. We, we adjusted the fact pattern so that it's easier to understand the math's a little simpler. Uh, but this, this particular RIA had a client, a um, mid 50 year old female client that had $15 million uh, in, in Golub Capital. Some of you on the call are going to be familiar with Golub, their private credit fund out of New York. I think they're in the $15 billion range. And historically they've done about a 10% uh, kind of coupon on their on their private credit fund, and so he said, "Hey, she, you know, she's got fifteen million bucks in this in this fund, but she's living on the after tax income. Could we relocate that to PPLI and make make that better for her?" And we said, "Well, I'm sure we'd be better, but we've never run that before, so let's do that." And that's again the genesis of the whole thing. So again, for this particular uh, case study, we just simplified it. We made it a male fifty California resident. And a, and a $10 million allocation of private credit again. So the math makes it a little easier just to kind of to see the see the math. Uh, but the fact pattern is still the same. We're going to assume this person's living off the net after-tax income that's being generated by this investment. And then they want to see the impact of moving uh, this private credit portfolio to PPLI. Um, so you guys have, have seen this before. This is our tax calc. This is where we, again, kind of present the problem uh, what's the, you know, what's the rate of return again for simple math. We said this $10 million balance is earning 10%. We know credit funds are, aren't impervious to ups and downs, right? So some, some years they make a little bit more, some years they make a little bit less, but just for simplicity, we said, let's model this out at 10. And because it's private credit, it's hundred percent ordinary, ordinary income, right? So investors in this particular case down here, they're going to get a million dollar distribution of interest functionally, right, throughout the year, but they're going to order income on all of that. So this particular poor soul, good for him. He's got 10 million bucks in a private credit fund. Uh, bad news is he lives in California. Well, good news is he lives in California. He's a great state, but bad news is he's he's getting whacked at the highest possible tax rate, right? So his $1 million distribution is getting whacked at 55%. So net, he's going to be at, uh, you know, right at 450, right? So again, not the worst thing in the world. This is a great, uh, you know, a portfolio for him to be spending, you know, but it's again, it could it be better? It's kind of a way to think about it. And Frank, you've done some of this before too. You had any comments on the private credit allocations, how investors are using those? No, I mean, I I, I would say that in 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 looking at our clients and 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 other people who I know that have uh, been using PPLI, I would say private credit is a investment sleeve of every single PPLI virtually that I right. can think of. Uh, yeah. Right. Private credit, private equity, uh, you know, some some slice of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a very, very much a very real world example. And like you said, unfortunately, this client's living in California. <laughs> so good news is, again, they've got 10 million in a private credit fund. They're going to get a bunch of income over their lifetime. So, again, we project out 40 years for this 50 year old. So about 18 million bucks in income but they're going to pay $22 million in income taxes. Again, assuming linear returns, linear tax rates, all that fun stuff. Um, so what would happen if we relocated that $10 million private credit uh, asset into PPLI? And, and real quick, one of the good, you, you know, why this is a good use case as well is, and most of you guys probably know this, but when we sell out of a private credit fund, because it's, they're passing through kind of basically all the gains every year via distributions, there's no tax consequence. So getting 10 million bucks out of that fund, now there might be some gates and hurdles and whatnot. Maybe they can't get it all at once, but but being able to get that $10 million out into PPLI and then basically reinvesting in that same fund is is what, you know, pretty a uh, pretty seamless um, move for the client and the advisor. Uh, so, so right to the punchline, right out of the gate, this $10 million dollars, uh, would be the same in either case, right? So 10 million bucks is status quo. There you see the 440 of income that they're, that they're living off of after tax. There's that cumulative income we just looked at right there. Um, and so what would that be in PPLI? Well, we take the 10 million bucks, we put it in PPLI, we buy that same credit fund. We can produce an, an after policy expense income annually of nearly $860,000. 
So again, we haven't changed the investment really at all, right? We've just taken it from taxable world and we put it in PPL and we bought the same fund. But because now we're blocking 100% of those income taxes and we're pay, choosing to pay policy uh, charges and fees and expenses instead, we've basically just increased the after-tax income nearly by 100%, right? I mean, from 440 to 857, so $417,000 improvement in income. Uh, over the yeah. lifetime, you see you see that. Go, go ahead, Frank. Yeah, no, I I think that you 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 said it beautifully in the in the sense that this we are not changing the portfolio allocation. This is an asset location device. Yeah. And it's really this ultimately just becomes an Excel spreadsheet problem of yeah. you know, are we providing a, a, a quantifiably better result because of where the assets are actually located? Yeah. Yeah. And I know we picked California, so super high tax rate. I mean, you you can imagine even if we completely dismiss the the state income tax uh, 15% in California, right? This still works beautifully. Maybe we're not doubling their income like you see here, nearly doubling it. Uh, you know, maybe we're getting 70% more instead of 90% more, but this is um, uh, this is a good, pretty incredible uh, improvement no matter what. So, and the other thing right here too, is we're leaving the same $10 million yep. at life expectancy or year 40 to the heirs, right? So we started with 10, we're going to leave them 10. In taxable world, that's what happens, right? You've got that $10 million corpus. Uh, you're going to spend all that distribution money throughout your lifetime. And then, you, then when you die functionally, you're going to leave the $10 million bucks to your kids or your heirs or beneficiaries or whoever that, that happens to be. Uh, so again, net to heirs is no different, but we basically double the client's expected income over their lifetime. And what you can right. see here, again, a lot of numbers, small on a page here, but you can see here, and I'll, I'll get, talk just for a second here, a little bit about the nuance of this. Um, but you can see the income coming out over here, all the tax that's coming out over here. Um, you can see that on the same side. This is the 857 coming out every year. Here's all the costs of the policy. You can see that there's a zero in the first year. We, I know we've just said it's a median income, and it is. This is what we're, what we're doing here, though, is we're doing a backdated policy where we can backdate a policy nearly a year in Alaska. So basically, I get the two $5 million payments in in 30 days. And then we instantly, cut, again, buy that credit fund and then start creating the distributions just like they otherwise would. So we're not actually waiting a year for the income. Um, we're actually getting that out in the first year. It just looks like that on a spreadsheet because of how we how we model out here. So any, right. any comments on that, Frank? Yeah, and, and so just to be clear, Ben, the way that we were solving here was to have the $10 million to equal the taxable side at life expectancy. If we actually said, you know what, we're going to, take it down to $2 million yeah. of a death benefit. Obviously that would just produce more income during the client's lifetime. That's right. And I think I think that's the other thing we're getting ready to look at too, right? Is the flexibility of this, right? I mean, it's one thing to just project this thing linearly at 10% and the tax rates never change. And I mean, look, this, this, this creates a credible baseline to say, okay, how much better is it? Functionally, the equation becomes, how much better is it to pay policy charges than tax, right? Now, once you've decided that it's better, then is it like, well, do I really want 857, you know, every year, right? Um, and, and that's kind of the next case study. If I just want to go right to that and say, all right, what if the client says, actually, yeah, I'm spending the after-tax income, but I don't really need more income. Um, you know, 440 a year is great for me. Let me just let me just accrue the, the 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 delta. Let me just accrue the rest. And maybe I'll spend some more in some years, or maybe I'll just give it all to the kids. I don't know. So what you can see here is this is what we call the match income scenario. So we're going to match the income that they're currently getting. So here that $10 million is still producing that 440 of after tax income. Uh, so here we're going to match that with the PPLI policy, right? So no improvement until we look at what do we get to leave our, our heirs, our kids. Uh, that's a pretty, that's a pretty stark number, right? I mean, that you go from leaving them 10 million to $183 million. Now, again, that's, that's the value of that compounding over 40 years. Uh, but that's a big difference. You can see that over here, um, again, this this kind of ledger analysis side by side, here's that 440 coming out to match the income over here. And every dollar that we don't pull out of the policy, we just accrue to the benefit of our, our of our heirs. And so you can see this net to heirs death benefit right here that this column, again, you can see it, it drops. So this is the advantage column way over here. So this $9 million, $9.5 million advantage is the low point. That's in year four. But then it just starts growing. And again, that's the compounding value of this, of this, all this extra income or this earnings that they're not taking as a distribution. They're just accruing it and buying more of that same fund. Over time, again, that's where we get all the way out to that $183 million uh, death benefit. Um, 
the other thing this allows the client to do too is really cool is again, credit funds, they don't just print a 10% coupon every every year, right? I mean, some years they're seven and some they're 12 or 15 or whatever, right? This allows the client in those lean years to have a little bit of a buffer, right? If, if we're, you know, maybe not taking out 440, maybe they say, hey, I don't, you know, I don't, I prefer more money, but I don't, I don't need that 850. Maybe I'm going to pull out 600,000. I'm going to crew or I'm going to kind of bank the excess earnings for future years. I bet you, again, you could show a $600,000 distribution every year and still, uh, again, give the client some buffer in those off years to be able to, to maintain that lifestyle. That's a great point. Um, any other thoughts or comments on, on this one on the match income, uh, Frank? No, I think this this is, you know, it's incredibly very powerful to me. Uh, I, you know, it's, I think the, the flexibility that you talked about, um, you know, and then it's really also where is the client going to want to hold this policy, right? Is this something they're going to personally own? Is this something that's going to be owned in an irrevocable trust, beneficiary considerations, access and, and that? Um, just I'm already thinking about the step up in basis if it's trust owned. But, you know, again, this is much more, you know, income oriented, but we do want to be thinking about the flexibility of, of planning and when where it is entity location also. Yeah, I mean, this could be owned. I mean, this this would be a great use case just for a client just to own this policy personally, right? I mean, that's the right. simple, easy, you know, again, that's that Staples easy button thing, right? Just, yep. just own it and pull the distribution straight to, you know, into your own bank account, right? You also could put this in a trust. You could put it in a slat or other trust where the client has access to income. Uh, and again, that then creates additional flexibility, additional leverage for state tax planning considerations. Because again, you don't really... I mean, this is a great case, right? I, we, we create the same level of income for the client and we create a $183 million asset at, at age 90. Problem is that $183 million asset, if they own it, right, it's going to get whacked with estate taxes. So if we're going to do this and we're going to create, again, some of that flexibility to asset creation for generational planning, uh, we want to be thoughtful about that up front. Yep. Uh, then the last scenario we look at is what if you guys have clients that have you know, investments in private credit that don't currently take the income. And again, this is the simple, you know, analogy here. You, you can already kind of get to the punchline, but, um, you know, to your point, Frank, I mean, I think all the policies we've put, we put in force in the past, you know, couple of years, almost all of them have, have had some exposure to private credit. So what if, the, what if your client has private credit currently and they're, they don't plan on taking the income, they just like the asset class. Again, it's a great asset class. It's horrible on taxation. So again, tucking private credit into PPLI, simply looked at from an accumulation perspective. Uh, let me roll up the balance and let me uh, give whatever that grows to to my kids, grandkids, whatever, um, creates a very, very powerful um, result. Again, when we don't have to pay those ordinary income taxes, either at the trust level or at the uh, or at the client level. So again, I think the, the theme here is, and I'll, I'll, I'll then go here to the, to the summary slide, whether you're looking at, at PPLI from an income tax play perspective for income generation for your clients. And by the way, it doesn't have to be private credit, right? I mean, if you, if you are creating income for your clients out of any asset class, maybe you're just selling positions that they've held a long time. Yeah. You've got capital gains tax treatment, uh, but we can block that too. Right. So again, let's look at PPLI from an income solve perspective, how much more creative, how much more beneficial can we be by creating that flexibility on the front end to get our clients more income? Because again, we're choosing to pay policy charges instead of the income tax. So we can max out their income, we can match their income or somewhere in between, right? Or we can just accumulate uh, the growth inside the PPLI and, and leave it ultimately to uh, to, to chari you know, charity or, or family or whatever it may be. Any other comments, Frank? Yeah, it, no, I think that in terms of, you're right. And I think that a lot of RIAs tend to think of, oh, private placement, that, that's where tax inefficient uh, assets should go. And 100%, right. it's going to, make those uh, assets look a lot different, right? Because of the tax blocking. But even assets that you would otherwise think of as efficient, if we model those out, you are going to see significant material differences in income levels that the client will be able to enjoy. So it is not really just about private credit or just about those, you know, assets that throw out or uh, throw off ordinary income taxes. Uh, it's really most assets. Yeah, right, right. 
uh, again, you hate to be the guy that says, man, PPLI is for everything and everyone, but, um, right. you know, and, given, given the architecture, you know, the investment architecture, like the flexibility, I, it's, it used to be, again, it was like very limited on the investment side. Again, now that, you know, our, our investment friends on the call, uh, now that they can do anything that they do taxably inside PPLI, again, you have the investor control issues to, to definitely consider. You have the diversification issues to consider. We got to, we got to be cognizant of those things. But man, does it really open up the kind of the box, the the you know the sandbox, so to speak, of what 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 works well, uh, you know, for for clients here. So yeah, and um, and, and and what I would say, because I feel very strongly on the PPLI side, like it's really not just about tax inefficient assets. PPVA is a little bit different, right? Because the tax structure is very different, and so in that particular yeah. case, you are going to be if you're taking income you are going to be more concerned about what type of assets you are putting into that structure uh, yeah. to make sure all the math is working in your favor. Uh, but the PPLI is a, a little bit of a different. Yeah, way. we actually look at that. I mean, we we tucked in a PPVA. Normally, when we review this particular case study with with advisors and clients, it's, it's just this. It's like, hey, max income, match income, accumulate. You know, again, it's going to be great. And clients go, oh, yeah, this makes a ton of sense. Yep. Uh, we tuck in a PPVA for you guys, just so you can kind of see there are use cases for it. We don't want to ignore it entirely, but you know, immediate income doesn't work because we're we're, add, we're adding an, an additional fee and we don't get any tax benefit, right? So uh, we'll show you guys that here in a second. But before we get to that, we want to talk about policy loans. Um, and, and Frank, you want to take this section to kind of walk through, because I do think this is a little misunderstood. We get the question all the time. We don't understand what's a policy loan, how's it work, you know, can't we just do withdrawals? And yeah, we, yeah, we can do that too. So you want to kind of walk this through for uh, for our yep. friends? All right. So we have the policy owner and the insurance carrier, right? So premium payment goes into the insurance carrier, the policy is issued. Remember, PPVA and PPLI, these are separate accounts. You are not, the client is not subject to counterparty risk with respect to their account value. So a separate account is established for the benefit of the client. And then those funds are invested in either in an SMA program, in insurance dedicated funds, or a combination of both. Uh, the investment manager will be pulling out their advisory fee from that account. Okay. There are monthly costs associated with that. Those, so those are your traditional COIs. And then in this world, mortality and expenses, I really tend to think of them as more administrative fees rather yeah. than something that actually has to do with a client's mortality. But basically you have COI costs and M&E charges, right? And so that's also coming out of the program. The client can take from the policy either distributions via withdrawals or policy loans. Withdrawals will just be simply your money coming back in your hands, and there clearly is no tax implications with respect to just recovering your own funds. Yeah, that's you know that's basis recovery, right? You just get the basis yep. back out of the policy. Yep. It, it, yep. Exactly. From that point forward, in terms of taking money out of the policy, policy loans can be used. Okay. These are not, you are not realizing any taxable, there's no taxable event going on. There's no realizing of actual gains. You are taking policy loans from your account and the carrier is simply issuing you a check for that. And you will see, and I think we mentioned this in a, in a separate page, you, there's no free lunch, right? And so Essentially, if you take a million dollars out of your policy, you will essentially see that account value and the death benefit be reduced by approximately that number. Right. Um, different carriers, I'm not sure if this is the next slide, different carriers yeah. are going yeah. to have different terms for the policy loans. Ben, why don't you take this page? Well, no, yeah, I was, I was going to say, we can just kind of get into that now again. So I, what I was doing back here on this, this previous graphic was just to remind everybody, again, the flow of funds. And then we're just going to park it right here for a second. Talk about the the policy loan page, because withdrawals are easy, right? I, I call the carrier, say I want to withdraw part of my basis or all of my basis, whatever. Again, they just send you the check. The deal with withdrawals though is you can't put that money back in. So if I if I've got a basis of ten million dollars, like we just had in the previous example, and I say give me my ten million dollars back, 
Um, that's great. It just it permanently reduces the death benefit. It permanently reduces that $10 million from the account value. Loans are great because I can I can put the money back in if I want. Um, what you've seen here on the, on the income slide that we just showed you uh, from the private credit fund, we're actually doing it. We'll show you that here in an example uh, here in a minute it, via an example. Where we're doing a combination of loans and withdrawals to, to basis, um, and so we'll show you that how, how that how that works. But again, the reason it's a policy loan is again it's it's how the insurance company works. But it's it's part partly how we're able to get this tax free, right? You don't if you go borrow money from the bank, you don't pay tax on that, right? Basically, you're borrowing from yourself. So the the carriers you can see here are going to charge you an interest rate. Uh, everybody sets their own interest rates. They're they're set at contract signing, so they're they're locked in. Um, and and there there are some flexibilities like Excellus you see there at the very top. It's a current thirty five basis point loan charge. Uh, it actually can go as high as sixty five basis points, but even then, again, that's not going to move the needle. Uh, so there is some variability in these policy loans, uh, but for the most part, they're they're they've been fixed at these rates you see here. And if anything, they're, they're coming down. Uh, carriers want clients to use the money in the policy uh, because it means they'll, they, they'll find more utility from it and they're going to use, it probably put more money in, right? So they, they make these loans very attractive. They want your clients to use it. And you can see that we put the cost there. Uh, you know, when you start getting in, you know, really, really low cost terms like this, I always have a hard time doing the math. I'm like, wait a second, 20 bucks, <laughs> $2,000. You, you want to make it 20 grand or whatever, right? So again, super inexpensive loans. Yep. Um, so if I go in and I grab a million bucks out of my policy at Prudential, again, it's $2,000 a year. And, and so if I never repaid it, right, it's never going to cause a policy structural problem. It's never going to cause the policy to blow up like you might see on a retail uh, retail contract. Uh, any comments on the on the uh, Excellus Prudential IPL section or the loan section? No, I guess I would only point out that, you know, I mean, it's still the, the Prudential, the fact that you get it at 11 plus, it's five BIPs. Yeah. I mean, it's virtually a frictionless loan. That's right. That's right. So the rest of the bullets here, just to kind of hit these at a high level, uh, you can pay the interest. The client can pay the interest. You can accrue the interest again, as we just said. Uh, it, it, again, if we're doing this kind of income solve um, for the client, we're, we're never going to repay these loans. We're just going to accrue the interest forever. Right. So that's the simplest way to do it. But if you've got a client, again, using the PPLI policy is somewhat of a, as a bank account as they should, right? And any other investment account that they get kind of free flow of funds back and forth. You know, if I pulled out a million bucks or $2 million or whatever it is, they want the ability to put that money back in, right? Because if they've got other taxable investments that are generating cash on their, on their balance sheet, it's a great utilization to get that money back in the tax free location of PPLI and not continue to su subject it to income tax along the way. So, as you see there, again, it's a reduction in net death benefit and cash value. And we're gonna, we've got a ledger. Again, we'll show you guys how this all works uh, on, a, on a numbers basis. The carrier has to have cash to distribute. So uh, that's one key factor, I think, that a lot of people kind of overlook or forget. If I've got, you know, again, in this particular case, $10 million in a private credit fund, I can't distribute money that I don't have if I'm the carrier. So they only distribute cash. So if you've got a portfolio full of marketable securities, uh, you know, an S and P, you know, fund, and you've got private credit and different things. Great, they just got to raise the cash. They got to sell some position, or they got to wait for distributions to come in in order to send that money back to the owner of the policy. Um, you can borrow on a fixed schedule, as we just saw. Again, every year, every quarter, whatever, I'm going to pull money out. Or you can again borrow money irregularly, right? I'm going to pull five million bucks out this year, and nothing next year, and nothing for ten years, whatever it may be. Again, there doesn't have to be a set schedule, but you can if you want to do that. And then ultimately, uh, you can borrow, depending on the carrier, you can borrow somewhere in the 85 to 90% range of all asset values, including your gains, right? Without any tax implication and without any risk of causing you know, structural policy problems. What we don't want to do with policy loans, right, is have a policy uh, lapse you know, when the client's 95 or 100, because then that creates a taxable event where all those loans are now treated as income. And that's, a, that's again, worst case scenario. So again, we policy limitations like you see down there at the bottom of the bottom of the page exist to prevent that from happening. Again, that's yep. that's the uh, Armageddon scenario that uh, that we at WealthPoint and obviously the carriers don't don't want ever to have happen. So that's why they limit that that way. Ben, I think also you know just to further emphasize because you you've made a you've mentioned it a couple of times and I think it's a really important point because our ledgers sort show level income coming out every year because we're just right. trying to establish a baseline scenario. 
you it can be take out in one year, don't take out for 10 more years, take right. out a huge amount in year 11 and then smaller, right? It, it's, a, it, it's a totally customizable uh, program account, right? right? right. And yeah. so um, really the, the flexibility of having that tax-free bucket is, I, I think, very valuable to most people's plan. Yeah, I think it's hugely valuable. And and the and the advisors that we work with that have used it, I think have seen that kind of in real life, right? They've gone, oh, this really does work like you guys say it works. You actually can yep. go get the money. Uh, and it doesn't cost my client anything. And then they can put the money back in when they, you know, again, the use case would be to be lifestyle income or again, an opportunistic investment where again, pursuant to investor control issues or whatever, the client wants to get involved in a in a startup or they want to do some real estate deal with a buddy or whatever. Fine, pull the money out tax-free, go do that deal. And then when that deal matures or, you know, creates, you know, you have the monetization event or whatever, put, put the money back into the policy and, and let it continue to grow. Exactly. Right. So it's here's the illustration not, of, yeah, how that works out. Frank, you want to walk this through just people can, again, kind of see visually what's going on behind right. the scenes. Again. Right. So, you know, think of, think of the PPLI. It's j it, just like any other account in here. There's maybe another piece instead of calling Schwab or Fidelity, right? And filling out a form and saying, send me my money or doing something online. We're going to do it via the insurance carrier. The owner is going to request a million dollars distribution, either possibly through withdrawal or policy loan, and the carrier will distribute the million dollars. As Ben said, it does have to be cash. So there is, pro you know, if you're fully invested, there will be a sale inside your policy to raise that cash. But again, it's a tax-free event and then ultimately a, ta a tax-free distribution to you. Uh, and again, roughly, we're going to see uh, if a million dollars is coming out of the policy, we are going to see a reduction of the cash value and the death benefit with a, as a, you know, with the commensurate figure. Yeah. And so on the next page, actually, we've got that kind of spelled out. So this is that yep. uh, max income ledger page. So we, we we were able to get yeah that ten million dollars in the private credit fund. We're able to get eight fifty two a year out. So how do we do that? How does that actually happen? So what you can see here again, we're going to backdate this policy. Um, we're going to get two premiums in right out of the gate. What you're going to see is an immediate. 852 coming out via a withdrawal. Again, this, this is the client that's never going to put this money back in, right? So we want to minimize the loan costs as much as possible. What's interesting about Prudential in particular is uh, we can take a withdrawal in any year in which a premium is paid, but then after that, no withdrawals are allowed for 15 years. And that's why you see we switch to a loan for the next, you know, 15 policy year for the 14 policy years. And then we switch back to withdrawals after that to get all of our basis back out. So again, Prudential, again, the, the costs aren't that much, but again, it's, it's this is the most efficient way to get the money out, I think, is what, what we're trying to communicate here. So you can see our loan interest column right here. Uh, we're going to start accruing loan interest in the in the uh, third policy year. Uh, year two really is what this is. So this is year one right here. This is year two. Uh, here's the loan balance that's going to be growing, and you can see that going right here. The account balance is, if you want to think of it, this is like the quote-unquote true account balance. But the net ca cash balance is what the investable balance is what you're going to see here. That's the money in the private credit fund plus any cash that's sitting in the in the PPL account here. So this number right here in the net cash balance is the account balance minus your loan, right? Super simple. Same thing on the death benefit. The, the gross death benefit is always more than our account value, right? It's reduced by our loan, but it's still always more than that. And so what happens is when the client dies, that death benefit pays off the loan and then the clients get the difference here as well. So if we look at you know this this year right here, the death benefits twenty seven million dollars, but I've got a you know what's my loan over here? It's you know wait I said twenty seven million. Uh, my loan's twelve million dollars, so I've got a net of fifteen million dollars to net, net to heirs, right? So yeah. again, when we report on this, when we provide annual annual reports back to our clients and to our advisors, all this stuff's going to be clearly spelled out, so the client knows you know where am I at from a uh, death benefit perspective, net death benefit to my heirs, net net death benefit or net cash value to me. You know, what are my options? What's my flexibility? Things like that. Um, so withdrawal in the first year, loans for the next 14 years. Then we switch back to withdrawals. Once we exhaust the basis, we switch back to loans. 
Uh, again, this is for that max accumulation or max income rather scenario. If if a client was going to do something different, um, again, we would adjust and, and make that custom for their situation. Thoughts, Frank? Yeah, no, this is, that's, it's the way There's it a works. lot here. I, I know right. that's why no, I wanted but... to pause for a second. I get in my own head, right? I start... It... Uh, and yeah. I just want to be clear, Ben. Obviously, I know the answer to this, but just for the for the, for the listeners out there, all of the fees when we when we're looking at both the withdrawal amount, right, income to the client, as well as the death benefit, this is net of all structural. Yes. Fees. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a really good point. I was just looking at the IRRs down here. Um, so this is inclusive, like so you're you know cash value IRR. Is our cost? Then you can you can see if it's a gross ten, we're at eight point eight seven. So that's a hundred and you know thirteen basis points of cost cash on cash. At a death benefit, it's a hundred and seven basis points. You know, for a fifty year old, like we're you, you can see this isn't free. I mean, this is to your point. I think you said earlier it's not a free lunch. An accumulation only scenario. It's going to be you know a fifty basis point kind of all in cost, right? I mean, ten million bucks just growing. We never touch it. You know the the, the M and E and the COIs on that's going to be around fifty basis points uh, for yeah. fifty. Here it's one hundred and seven, right? So it's actually expensive, quote unquote, it's twice as expensive to use your money. But again, it's it's creating twice the benefit, twice the outcome for the client. So we want clients to be aware of that. And again, I gross ten, you know, I net nearly nine um, compared to netting five. Uh, you, you can tell like over time that's really gonna that's really gonna add up. So great point though on the fees. This is inclusive of all that. Again, the loan interest, yep. all that stuff. All right, so let's pivot real quick here at the end. We've got maybe 20 more minutes. We, we may end a little early on this one, which will be a first for us. But let's take a quick look at PPVA for income because this has been used a lot. Uh, I've got a good friend at uh, Morgan Stanley that they do a lot of PPVA and they do these, you know, these private credit funds uh, in PPVA. And again, I think this is a fine use case for it. But as we just looked at, I think PPL is probably even better uh, provided you can actually do that. But let's look at the PPVA uh, summary real quick of like, what's this $10 million moving into the PPVA on a, on a max immediate income? And then let's look at this here it's starting in year 15. Let's defer for a little bit. So as we already alluded to, um, immediate income coming out of PP, PPVA, as you can see right out of the gate, it's not good. In fact, it's worse off, right? Why is that? It's because we're adding fees, unnecessary fees. All distributions coming out of PPVA are coming out ordinary income tax rates. So we're taking an ordinary income tax asset, we're dropping it in a, in a vehicle that has ordinary income taxation and we're adding fees. Not a good, not a good scenario. Um, unless Frank, you, you can make a compelling case. Otherwise I, I can't. Not, not really. That one's going to be a tough one to beat. And I think this goes to the point, right. Of when we are talking about assets and PPLI and PPVA, why I think that it's more important, you know, it's much more significant to be conscious of those assets that are going into the PPA, PPVA contract because we're turning everything that goes in there that's right. into potential ordinary income rates. Yeah, that's so right. It doesn't work. Immediate income, that's that's then that's, not, gonna that's not going to be exactly. a good one. It's no good. It's no good. Um, so what about waiting, though, and and looking at it starting in year 15? And, and so this is the, actually, I think, the use case for a lot of times. Clients are saying, look, I don't need immediate income. I might need income later. I might use it for income later. I might move states. I might move from California to Texas. Now, I, again, I got to drop my, my tax bracket by, you know, a third, whatever that may be. That's a great use case, right? Uh, 10 million bucks is going to create income of a million million dollars. If we let it accrue, right, we keep buying, you know, more shares of the fund or whatever it may be. Uh, but in PPVA, we're able to get to one one and a half million dollars of after tax income. So we we pick up a, a pretty sizable, again, a thirty percent, thirty five percent improvement in income by relocating a private credit fund into PPVA and then waiting fifteen years to take income. Great use case, right? Yep. Uh, and then on the, on the accumulation scenario down here too, same thing, right? Like on a net to heirs basis, PPLI or this says PPLI. Sorry, we changed that PPVA advantage. Uh, Again, just because we're able to accumulate and defer, even accounting for the fact that our heirs are going to pay um, an, a, a income tax on, on receipt of those assets, we're still coming out over $100, $100 million ahead by not paying annual income taxes along the way, right? Um, any other questions or, or comments on this, Frank, before yeah, we the, come the, the I, I would just add, and I understand that this is a, you know an income-oriented uh, presentation, but we are seeing, right, I mean, a typical... 
one of the typical use cases of PPVA is that accumulation story. And really then it becomes an, an end of life charitable donation. And in that case, then I'm not as concerned, right, as to what those underlying assets are. You are going to be better yeah, off right. in a pure deferral vehicle that that cost structure, let's call it 40 to 50 basis points, is going to, in almost every case, be lower than the the, the taxes in the taxable account. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, and, and, and to that point, we unpacked all of that in great detail in our second deep dive, right? We, we mentioned that earlier in the in the uh, webinar. So if you want to go back and look at those again, all the different case studies are unpacked there. So we encourage you to do that. So uh, we'll, we'll quickly peel through the the ledger pages and, and uh, then open it up for Q&A here at the end. But again, as we said, the immediate income doesn't work. You can see that very plainly here. The weight and take income later is, a, again, a very powerful use case for PPVA. Um, here's that $10 million going in. This is, this is taxable accounts over here. Here's, here's the PPVA account over here. We dumped the, we dumped the money in year one. We let it grow starting all the way out here in year, whatever that is, 15. So age 65 client starts taking maximal income out of both accounts. In my taxable world, I can take a million bucks, million 65 every year through my age 95 over here, 3.4 million dollars can, can come out because of the power of all that compounding, right? I get to pay a much higher tax rate in that particular case, but again, maybe I've moved states, maybe something else has happened, but I'm still netting another half million dollars by deferring those, the, the growth of those assets for that 15 year period of time. And then ultimately again, where we, you know, we end up leaving more to the heirs in that, uh, you know, 40th year or whatever, simply because again, we've got more assets uh, to, to leave them. Any I mean, thoughts? Ben, yeah, Ben, I mean, right. Would you say it, it's, it's fair to describe PPVA is certainly in one sense as a, a qualified account with unlimited contributions and no RMDs. And I think that this, I, and I understand it's age 65 and not age 73, but this sort of, you know, even if they were sort of simulating RMDs, it, it, it really works. But again, it's about the flexibility. You don't have to take it, yeah, right? right? We can, we don't have to do it every year or we can do it every year. But it's un, it's it's in the client's control, and you're not following some government regulation that's making you do it. A hundred percent. I think that's a great point. Uh, we we often refer to PPLI as the uh, the unlimited or super Roth IRA, right? It's it's that you know with with none of those same age income or or account funding limitations, um, right? I can I can put money in at any time. I can take it out at any time pre fifty nine and a half. Yep. Uh, you can't do that here. You can't take it out pre-59 and a half here. Again, PPVA actually is regulated on that side, but you also don't have to start taking it out. There are no RMDs to your point. So yeah, PPLI is like a like a Roth. PPVA is more like a traditional IRA, a more of a qualified account. But again, there's so much more flexibility, right? Um, you, you you have none of those age income limitations, things like that. And again, the longer you let it go, the better it gets. Yep. Um, here's the accumulation only scenario. So again, this is, Again, we unpacked this more in the charitable uh, webinar that we did a couple of months ago. But this is the client that says, hey, I'm not taking income. I don't think I'll need income out of this, but I, I also don't know what I'm going to do. My estate planning is it's mostly done, but also there's flexibility. I'm not really sure. Again, here it's simple. It's like, hey, put the $10 million in, let it grow. This PPVA advantage column all the way over here on the right is how much better is it to my heirs on a net after-tax income? Uh, even if, So if I change my mind, this might be, I, I plan to give this to charity but I also might want to give it to my kids or grandkids. So this is the, I changed my mind and I'm going to leave it to my kids over here. So this is that $106 million number that I referenced earlier. You know, that's that 40 year line all the way out. Uh, you know, that's how much better it is to just the power of compounding and, and deferring those taxes for, for the 39 or 40 years that we, we get to wait. So this is kind of the best of both worlds. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know that I need any income. I'm going to accrue it all. And then I might leave it to charity. I might leave it to my kids. And, and what's what's the benefit to to the client and the advisor? So pretty powerful there too. Yeah. And I think this is a great slide for those, anybody who was thinking about, well, I know it doesn't work immediately and yeah. it for sure works after 15 years. When does it actually start to work? Yeah. Right. In year three, right? right. After year three, you are better off in, in, in this pure deferral account regard, you know, yeah, no, even if you die and you left this ordinary income taxable account to your kids, your kids are still better off in that in that fourth year 
Yep. Uh, not, not, not by a ton, obviously, but uh, uh, there's some measure of improvement over that. And again, yep. we would still argue if you're unsure about something to do, again, PPI is probably worth the additional cost just because of the tax flexibility. But again, the cool thing about PPVA is we can put money in in any year at any time in any amount. Uh, with PPLI, again, we're limited by the design feature of that. We can we tell them we're going to give them 10 million bucks. We can't just give them an, an, another 20. Uh, here you can. You can put in 10 and then 10 years later, put in another 20 or 30 or 40 or 100 or whatever. So um, yeah. pretty flexible. And, and, and one other difference between PPVA and PPLI is, I mean, there's no underwriting. This is that's right. This is this is really just establishing account that's going to take a couple weeks, just like yep. most other accounts. And then you're off to the and races sits on the Schwab platform or Fidelity or whatever, just, just like a PPLI account would be. So uh, look, look at us, Frank. We, uh, a 50, or actually it's 45 minutes because we started a little late today. So 45 minute webinar on on ordinary, on ordinary, on, on immediate income from PPLI. Good work. Good work. Yeah, well done. <laughs> uh, hopefully, does anybody have any questions out there on how it works, different examples, the loans, I, we always get questions on loans. So if there's anyone who has a question on loan, we'd be happy to uh, happy to tackle that. Um, but there, we we do it while we wait on that. We do have some some uh, upcoming resources you see here on the page. We we are going to take the summer off from deep dives, give you guys a break from listening to us yap yammer on about all this. Uh, but we'll have four more deep dives in the fall. We'll get those dates and topics out to you guys shortly. Uh, we've also got an ebook that's coming out. Uh, and corresponding videos. So we shot some videos that kind of correspond to some ebook chapters that we wrote. That's very cool. So the ebooks, I think, twelve chapters. Basically, it's a little bite size, like what it is, the tax problem, all the kind of stuff we consistently talk about and educate about. Uh, but we have like wordsmithed this thing to death. So uh, we hope you guys like it. We we hope it's again educational in nature. So we hope it's helpful for you guys understanding what PPLI is, what it isn't. And also, hopefully, it's a great piece for you guys to take to your clients. You say, hey, don't, you know, demystify this whole thing. What is it simply? We hope that's what those resources are. Um, so I'm not seeing any uh, yeah. any questions. I think this means we're getting good at this, Frank. I, I, I'm sure that's exactly what it means. Uh, you know, what? there was one deep dive that we did uh, on the legislation uh, yeah. surrounding PPLI. That, has, that was not recorded. But That's if right. anybody does have questions regarding what is going on um, in Congress right now, feel free to reach out directly to Ben or myself, and we'll be happy to share our thoughts. I think, Ben, you just got back from uh, some big wig convention last week. Right? Yeah, I was going to say I was just in D.C. last week uh, at, a, at a conference and half of a day at the conference uh, we spent on Capitol Hill meeting with legislators. Uh, advocating for uh, our profession and for the tax treatment of life insurance specifically. So uh, productive conversations, some more productive than others. Some were not productive. <laughs> we, we, met with some, we met with some legislators that that were not friendly, uh, but that's okay, right? I mean, that's that's their deal and our job was to advocate for it. Uh, but I, again, we, we think from a legislative risk perspective, there's, there's virtually no risk of any issues uh, this year and really, really into the next session just because of all everything else that's going on. So we feel good about all this. Um, hey, look, we had a question pop up. Yeah. How are the asset fees managed? So the question is, how are the asset management fees accounted for on the policy? So we have actually disregarded asset management fees. So if we want to go back here, I'll scroll back to this uh, uh, chart here. Um, so the portfolio management fees, the, advi or the, yeah, the advisory fees that are being paid to the investment manager, the RIA, the bank, the family office, whatever, multifamily office, we, we disregard that in these calculations because it's going to be the same on either side of the ledger, right? So if it's in a taxable account and you're charging 50 bips for a portfolio you know, management fee, uh, you know, planning fee, whatever it is that you charge, or it's 50 bips inside the PPLI, um, they're, they're, they're a wash, right? I mean, yes, the policy grows faster. So it actually, you know, from an, from an investment management perspective, you're actually getting, getting a better account to manage, but um, we don't actually account for those in these ledger pages or in the policy loan fees and all that, because it's just not, um, it's not material because it does because it washes functionally. Right. But the, but the fees are simply coming out as you would imagine in, in any other type of account where that asset manager is, is in control, right? So in the same way that, 
my stuff is, you know, is uh, Fidelity or Schwab, and I'm paying my asset manager X amount every quarter, you're going to see the same thing coming out of the PPLI policy. That that management fee is not treated as as a loan. That's simply yeah. That's actually. I just noticed that's the second half of the question from Sean. He's saying, are 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 the asset management fees that come out of that SMA or the IDF are those treated as loans? And the answer is no, they're not. They're just they're treated as expenses or admin fees against the policy. Right. So I hope that's I hope that's helpful. And Sean, feel free to reach out if you, if, that, if that did not answer your question. All right. So I think that's it, folks. Thanks for uh, tuning in for uh, immediate income from PPLI and PPVA. I hope we found this helpful. Reach out if, if a case, if a particular client or fact pattern popped into your head, uh, feel free to reach out and say, hey, I got a guy, I got a gal. Uh, here's the facts. We'd love to do that. Again, we've built all these tools to serve you and your clients and help you guys uh, educate your clients and be educated yourself on what's possible and the flexibility on everything. So again, reach out, let us know the fact pattern and we're happy to help you guys uh, with any of that. So with that, thanks. Frank, great job Thank as always. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. You, Ben. See you next time.